I engage with my life on the level of my heart. Together, I engage with my life on the level of my heart. You know, how many of you have a dog? Raise your hand. Dogs will help you to lighten up. <laughs> Today's affirmation is I move into the now by lightening up and letting go. Together, I move into the now by lightening up and letting go. And it's that lightening up part that's so difficult for so many of us. But if you have a dog, it's not as hard, right? <laughs> Unless, of course, you're like my friend who had an Alsatian who had a beautiful coat, except for she'd read that the coat would even get more beautiful if she would feed the Alsatian two tablespoons of cod liver oil oh, every geez. morning. <laughs> and, gee, two tablespoons of cod liver oil every morning. And so she would wrestle the dog to the ground, and she would force the cod liver oil into, into, the, into the mouth. And it was just an awful experience. Maybe the first tablespoon was okay, but the second one was always hell. Yeah. And so one time, she, she was fighting with the dog, wrestling with the dog. It got so bad that the dog knocked over the cod liver oil, and she got up and she had to, 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 to take care of the cod liver oil. And what happened? The dog was eating the cod liver oil avidly, was just <laughs> lapping it up. The problem wasn't the cod liver oil. The problem was she was using the wrong method. She was forcing. She was forcing. You know, with dogs, you got to kind of lighten up. Uh, I don't know how many years I've been trying to keep the dog off the couch. It's never worked, but you know, I can't <laughs> keep the dog. But sometimes dogs teach us to lighten up. Sometimes kids teach us to lighten up. And sometimes that kid in us teaches us to lighten up. And maybe we need to try a different method and not force that cod liver oil down our proverbial throat. Now, how, how can we do that differently? By approaching our spiritual path, our spiritual practices with joy and with lightness. And, you know, allowing things to just be. I allow things to just be. Together, I allow things to just be. Just be. I'm teaching a, a class on The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. How many people have read that book? It, we're going to be having another class Tuesday night. You're welcome to come. And one of the things I notice about Eckhart Tolle is that he, uh, he says we have two ways of moving into the now. The first is by being present and observing ourselves in the now and moving into the now. I mean, that's real simple, right? But what happens when you don't? What happens when you find yourself having those thoughts and those, those attitudes? You, you're watching yourself, you know, behaving or thinking or, or feeling in ways that you wouldn't necessarily want yourself to. What do you do then? He said, that's your second chance. You can be in the now watching yourself not being in the now. You can observe yourself resisting. You can either let go of resistance or you can observe yourself resisting and so move into the now that way. What a weird thing, but it is a way to not force things. You don't have to always do it right. You're not always going to get everything right. What you're going to do is watch yourself have a pissy attitude. <laughs> You're going to watch yourself have those thoughts. And you know what? When you do that, you're in the now. Do you know why? Because you can't be conscious and unconscious at the same time. So being conscious of yourself being unconscious makes you conscious. Moves you into that now moment. What a, what a wonderful thing and how freeing that is when we can let go into that now moment. Now what is this now moment I'm talking about? This affirmation that I came up with came up during this five-day retreat. I was down in Tarpon Springs, Florida with Jane Elizabeth Hart, and we did some really deep work. We do that every year when we go on a retreat. And life-transforming experiences happen. And what came out of it for me is really encapsulated in this affirmation. I move into the now. In every moment, I move into the now by lightening up and letting go. That every moment, you know, that was one of the things that I shifted. It adjusted me. I thought I was going to have this moment when I moved into the now. Like the now was the thing. And I was going to move into it. But every moment is an opportunity. In fact, that's the point of the now, right? Every moment. You know, Jesus talked about the now, but he called it the kingdom of heaven. What, what is this kingdom of heaven? Kingdom of heaven, the, it's... it's um, 
it's that spaciousness, it's that leavening in, in the bread, he says. It, it creates space and opens things up. It's that opening up in that now moment that makes the bread palatable, right? It's not hard tack anymore. It's edible bread. And it's that wonderful opening. He also, when he used the word heaven, heaven in, in Hebrew was sky, the same word as sky. There's not an accident. It's like the sky. Think about yourself looking up into the sky. Have you ever been able to grasp the sky? Can you touch the sky? Jimi Hendrix said. Uh, can, you, can you reach the sky? No, it's limitless. It's infinite. And the now moment is infinite. Heaven is infinite and is in the now moment. There's no, there's no thing of it. There's no thing, the sky, because the sky goes on forever. And think about your consciousness, your being. Your being goes on forever. The now moment goes on forever. You are that infinity. You are that eternity. You are that now moment. So, in every moment, in every moment, I move into the now by lightening up and letting go together. In every moment, I move into the now by lightening up and letting go. What about those moments you don't like? We want to get rid of those moments, right? But could it be that those are the most precious moments of all? Oh, they are if you work them right. Remember Jesus said, many of the first shall be last and many of the last shall be first. And we interpret that rightly as meaning many of the people who put themselves first will be last and many of the people who are humble put themselves last shall be first. But there's another way of looking at it. You can interpret it metaphysically and understand that many of the circumstances in your life that you judge as last or first and many of the circumstances that you think are first may be last. A friend of mine demonstrated this to himself. He was a Baptist youth minister who was in my apartment building. We became best friends. We didn't talk about religion, though, because he knew that I was in that woo-woo church that's ground all went to, where they all hold hands and sway. And, um, and I knew that he was, you know, in a very rigid, narrow-minded belief system. And so we didn't ever talk about it. We talked about rock and roll records instead. Years later, of course, now he's a practicing Buddhist who goes to Mass with his wife, is how he describes himself. But anyway, in those days, he would go over his year on New Year's Day and give a letter grade to his year. And it would be given a grade according to whether or not the year fulfilled his expectations, whether he got what he wanted and whether he liked the year. And he did this year after year until a spiritual path took him in a whole different journey and he stopped doing it. He fell away from that because he was living more in the now. Years later, he found his sheet of paper with all of his letter grades and he reflected on the fact that the years that he graded as being so terrible actually were giving him more of a gift, were actually more valuable. If anything, he graded them the highest. And the years that he had graded as kind of low, really... They weren't all that great. It was just getting what he wanted and living comfortably. He saw things differently in this now moment. This is a precious moment. You can see things as an opening, even if it's not to your liking, especially when it's not to your liking. I'll never forget the most precious week I spent with my daughter, Rosalie. You know, Megan sang the serenity prayer, and Rosalie's in New York City now in college, and she doesn't have a lot of money to spend, but she said she spent some money this last week on a coffee cup. She said, we need coffee cups in our dorm room, but it really was what it said. She was walking out of Marshall's there in New York City, and there was a coffee cup that had the serenity prayer on it. She said, I needed that reminder. I needed that reminder to remember what I could control and what I couldn't control. And she said, you know what I can control? Where I put my attention. What I can't control is all the outcomes. You say, well, I want to control the outcomes. But you know what? If you're controlling where you put your attention, strangely enough, the outcomes will roll out in a better way. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom, and then all the things will be added unto you. And remember where he said that the cornerstone, the least, like, the least likely stone is going to be the cornerstone? That, that, and sometimes the least likely experiences in life are going to be your greatest experiences. And so she and I spent a week together when she was seven years old in Colorado, ostensibly to go skiing. We bought the ski passes. We paid for the condo. 
And then it started snowing and snowing and snowing. In 48 hours, it was the greatest snowstorm in the history of Colorado, which is saying something. How many feet of snow? I'm going to just ask for a show of hands. I'm going to go up the numbers. Do you think it was three feet? Raise your hand. Four feet? How about five feet? How about six feet? How about seven feet of snow? Seven feet of snow in 48 hours. We were totally snowed in. We couldn't do anything. And the radio stations were shut down. And the television and the cable. We did have electricity, thank goodness. But we had nothing to do. No distractions. No electronics. No nothing. But we had paper. And we had crayons. And colored pencils. And we had the most wonderful bonding experience. We were drawing pictures. We were playing. We were the Powerpuff Girls. We were. She got to be one. I got to be another. We did role play. We'd, we'd go out and where we could go in the snow and play around. But we were in the now moment. And I'll never get over that week. It bonded us, I'm sure, at a level that is permanent. Where in your life can you embrace something that looks mm, wonky? It's wonky. And you're not necessarily supposed to like it, but you can love it. You can make peace with it. You can, in the words of Byron Katie, love what is, let it be. How can you do that? Well, by lightening up and letting go. I lighten up and I let go. Together, I lighten up and I let go. How do you lighten up? Well, maybe, maybe by loving yourself a little bit. Not forcing the cod liver oil in there so much. It's good to be intentional. It's good to have discipline. But to be gentle and, and, and kind to yourself. You know my kids, when they were younger, they were in elementary school and they just didn't find their tribe. You know what I'm saying? Did you experience that? A lot of people come into unity because, well, we're just a little bit different. <laughs> I don't know, some of us are more different than others. But... but, but my kids just, they hadn't found their, their, their tribe yet. And I said to them, you just stick around. You just wait. And you'll find your tribe. And there are going to be people who will appreciate, yeah, but, you know, people just don't get me. Yeah, but they will. Just, just wait. Just wait. And isn't it true? And they did. They found their tribe. I remember, this is a little off topic, but I remember the uh, rock and roller Jerry Garcia, when somebody asked him how come so many people didn't like his music, but if so many people were fanatic, a few people were fanatical about it, he said, well, we're a little like licorice. Not many people like licorice, but people who like licorice really like licorice. <laughs> and in your life, there are going to be people who really like licorice, but not if you're unwilling to be the licorice that you are. Jesus talked about this when he said, you've got to be like salt. And if the salt loses its flavor, you've got to be salty if the salt is this flavor, it's good for nothing that's just trampled on. And isn't it true if you're not yourself, if you don't cherish yourself and let yourself express, well, you get trampled on. You've got you to gotta be who you are. You've got to be that salty self. I am my salty self. Together, I am my salty self. So be your bad self. Be your salty self. Let that out. And as the kids embrace that part of themselves, they found they could be pretty much themselves. And you can be pretty much yourself. And not expect all this out here to change for you to be okay. That was one of the things that came up this coming weekend. The world out here does not need to change for me to be okay. I can put my attention on the one thing that I have control over, which is on my now moment. Lightening up and letting go. Lightening up and letting go. But we move from one level of consciousness to another. It's like getting a new pair of glasses, isn't it? Have you ever experienced a big change in your perspective in life? You know, it's like getting that new prescription. And even though you know intellectually that really the reason why you're having a hard time with your new glasses is because they're better. It doesn't feel better. It feels weird. It feels weird. But when you open up and then you get used to it, every time you make a shift, every time you make a shift in your consciousness, Every time you stand up for your being, every time you allow yourself to be salty and live up to your licorice flavor and whatever it is that's your spiritual destiny, whenever you do that, it looks a little weird. It looks a little weird to your friends too, I'm just telling you. And they'll let you know that, but don't worry about it because you have that in you that is growing and changing and expressing at all times. 
And that, that's a wonderful self. Uh, so, so let's talk a little about this. We're moving into the now moment by lightening up and letting go, letting things be. How do you do that? Well, you can say, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God, together. Thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God. Many years ago, uh, just before I came here, in fact, I was uh, speaking in Florida. I spoke at a lot of churches, and one of them was in Daytona Beach. And it was on the beach that I was staying in a little cottage. And um, I didn't have the f uh, phone number of the church, or, or I didn't take my cell phone with me on Sunday morning when I went out for a run to watch the sunrise. And it was so beautiful. I was in the now moment. I came back, and the door was locked. Well, I reached down to get the key, and it was gone. It was inside. So I thought, well, no big deal. I'll just go to the office. You know, it's, there's an office for these cottages. And uh, nobody was there. Well, there's a little phone next to it. And it said, in emergency, after hours, pick up phone. I picked it up. It rang. And it rang. And it rang. Well, here it was about mm, 7 o'clock. I have to be there at 9. Hmm. What do I do? Well, I just kind of thought to myself, and I thought, hmm. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Together. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Can you feel those bubbles coming up? Coming up inside you. You start looking at things more playfully. You look at things a little different. So, so I remember hearing that the hotel next door was owned by the same company. Maybe they could help me out. I walked over there and I went to the front desk and they said, no, no can do. It's a separate thing. We don't have any keys. Sorry. Huh. So what am I going to do? I just said, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God. And I found myself getting into line, and, and they had their breakfast buffet, and I illegally ate my breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> they great. Had an extra cup of coffee. Uh, went back to the desk. They said, no, we can't help you with this. So I went back. There's nobody in the office. Now it's 8 o'clock. Mm. Well, you know the good thing to do when you're in a situation, when, well, something like that, where it looks like there's a downside, is to surrender to what is. So I thought to myself, the worst thing that could happen is that I don't show up. <laughs> there are ministers there. She'll have to give a talk, and I'll never see those people again. So it's okay. <laughs> but I, I just made peace with it. Make peace with it. You know, it's a worst-case scenario, but sometimes that helps. And then I just, I just I picked up the phone, no answer. I, okay. And I just was in that playful space. I felt the bubbles. And I just kind of walked around, and I saw a window it was behind me, but I don't know. What if I knocked on that window? What would happen? It would probably make somebody mad, right? But it's 8 o'clock. They can't be too mad on a Sunday morning. So I knocked on it. This guy came out. He was so mad, but he was the manager. And I explained to him what happened, and he grudgingly opened up, and I was able to make it. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Together. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. You see, the solution to my problem was not found on the level of the problem, but on a completely different level. Einstein said, no problem can be solved from the consciousness that created it. We must learn to see the world anew. Learn to see the world anew. Those are those new glasses. But when you see the world anew, you show up differently. Your life You've got to let go of control. Ah, so you're lightening up, but you're letting go. But letting go of what? The control. The control that we have. The idea that, that we are going to control every outcome. We control the one thing we can control, which is where we put our attention, and then we let everything roll out from that. And you say, well, what about my prayers? I mean, I want to pray for the outcomes and the good solutions and the healings. These aren't bad things, Greg. Don't take that away from me. And I'm not. I think we should pray boldly, but receive flexibly. I pray boldly, and I receive flexibly. Together, I pray boldly, and I receive flexibly. So you put it out there, and then you receive flexibly with open hands, open hearts, open minds. And then you allow the form to change because what? Because your purpose in living in this life is what? To grow. And what if growth... Your spiritual nature is requiring you to experience something maybe a little different. Ah, so how does that show up in your life? Well, I remember how it showed up when I was in ministerial school. We had a list of all the churches that were open and we'd all apply to them. And many of the first shall be last and many of the last shall be first. I was the first of my class to be placed and the last to take a church. 
because I accepted a church, but because of life choices, I couldn't go there, or at least felt I couldn't. And the only area I felt I could go, there were no openings except for this one church, which was the church that we in ministerial school laughed about because it looked so unwelcoming in the little blurb that was in there. And we said, who's going to end up there? <laughs> and I only ended up there because the other guy, there were only two people that even applied to it. The other guy was 78 years old and he got sick. So they had no other candidates and they needed a minister desperate enough to hire the kid. <laughs> and so I came in there and it was quite an experience. But you want to know something? It was the greatest experience I could have had. I grew so much. It opened my heart. I learned so many things. It was, I mean, it was a wonderful six years I spent there because it was a growth-filled experience. It was something that was opening me up in every now moment. And I, I remembered that in my next church. When I was there, and I've shared before, I was their fifth minister and four had left in 11 months. And, and I, I called Edwin Gaines because I was going through some tough times. And she said... Greg, congratulations, you're having an initiation. And I said, what's an initiation? And she said, you know, the walls of your heart need to be taken down. You need a bigger heart. You need a heart opening in your life. And what better way than to deal with some difficult situations and difficult circumstances. And as long as I stayed in that heart opening space, everything worked out over time. I learned so many things. But here's the thing. You're not going to learn everything perfectly. You're not going to do everything perfectly. You're not going to cram the cod liver oil down your throat. You're going to learn the way you're going to learn in the pace that you're going to learn it. You're going to do what you're going to do. And you're going to be gentle with yourself as you go through this experience in life. You're going to be gentle with yourself and you're going to move into a new consciousness. But you've got to have, you've got to have a prayer for the energy of God, the life of God, to fill. That's the purpose of our prayers. It's like the universe is molten gold. It's just flowing, infinite gold. But you've got to have a form, a receptacle, a mold for it to fill. And that thought form, that prayer, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> that is that mold, that is that receptacle, that is that, that, that something that is what you are, are putting forth in your prayer. And then the gold comes into that form. Think about that. That's, but also know that you're receiving flexibly, that you're not locked into form, that your heart is open and that you're willing to see things in a very, very different way than you had in mind. And I had a friend of mine who's a unity minister and I went to speak in his church one, one week. He was up in Montana. And he and his family, he had a pretty good sized family, and they needed a house. And uh, he said that they couldn't find any house but one house, and they just were ready to take possession of it. But he said, you know what? I don't like the energy of this house. I don't like this house, but I know, I know in my heart it's the right house, but it just doesn't feel right. I don't know. There's something about it. I just don't get it. So what we did was we held hands, and we did a blessing of every room. And we changed the energy in that house. And he really, he, he even said, you know, when I took possession of this house, I felt like I'd been slimed, you know, like in Ghostbusters. But it changed the energy. It became a nurturing, wonderful place. And the real estate market took off. They were able to flip the house and get their dream house. It was the perfect way for that to take place. But it took, it took some flexibility. It took some flexibility. You, 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 you don't know. You just don't know. But you can let go. You can let go. You know, sometimes when you're, when you're puzzling over, over what to do, just ask yourself, if I could see this with new eyes, how would it look to me? What would I, how would I show up in this situation? I want you to pull out something here. And that is, this is your, your spiritual thermometer. Many of you have received this spiritual thermometer in the past. This is from my meditation teacher, Jane Hart, with whom I spent last weekend uh, on a retreat. And this, this little method is a wonderful and simple way of moving into the now moment. It's so simple. But in any given moment, you can ask yourself, where am I on a scale of 1 to 10? And then just ask, okay, accept the number, okay? So I'm going to ask you to do that right now. Ask yourself, where am I on a scale of 1 to 10? Where am I? And just take a number. If it's below a 5, it's... Uh, 
in your limited self, but it's okay, you can observe it. And then ask yourself, where would I like to be? And just take that number and then just say, if I was at that number, if I was an 8 or a 9 or a 10 or whatever, how would things look to me? How would things feel for me? What would be my thoughts if I was at this higher, higher number? How would my body feel? What tension would melt away? How would I sit? And just kind of be there for a moment. Now feel how lifted you are. Feel how different things look. Feel how open and spacious, like the sky, like the leavening in the bread. This is the now moment. That's all there is. And as I move more deeply into this awareness, I lighten up and I let go. And I move into this now moment. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And so it is. Amen. And now I want you to take a nice deep breath and let it out. And, and imagine that you're putting on a new set of glasses. And those of us who have worn glasses, remember what happens when you've waited maybe a little too long to change prescriptions? And you get that new prescription. And although you know that these new lenses are perfect, so much better than the old lenses. There's a period of adjustment. It's time for us to let go of our old glasses, our old ways of looking at things, and to imagine that we're putting on new glasses, a new perspective, knowing that, yes, there'll be a time of adjustment. What I need to do is to move into this now moment. In every moment I move into the now by lightening up and letting go. And so just settling into our bodies, feeling the energy in the space inside our bodies, becoming aware of the life that is there. We move once again into the thought. In every moment I move into the now. By lightening up and letting go. There's a sacred peace in this moment. And as I settle into my body, I can let it go. In this now moment, I feel peace. And the bubbling up of joy as I lighten up. up and I let go. I let go of my need to control through anything in the outer. And I exercise control over the one thing I do have control over, where I place my attention right now. And as I watch my breath, Feel my heart beating. Become aware of the energy. I'm stabilized and centered. 
calm and at peace. I move in this now moment. By lightening up and letting go. I move into this now moment of infinite peace. This moment of joy by lightening up and letting go. Without thought. I move into this now moment. By lightening up, feeling the bubbles of effervescent joy within me, imagining a clear glass full of soda. The bubbles come up and I see them in me. I'm lifted up. And I let go without thought. I let go. This is the moment, the perfect moment for me to experience peace and joy and love and growth and all that is and I am that I am. Every need is fulfilled, every good prayer goes forth. And I receive flexibly and openly my hands, my heart, my mind open. Thank you, thank you, God. And so it is. Amen. So, thank you so much. That was great. And we're going to uh, take our offering now. And our offering statement is, I give in the now because that's all I got. Together. <laughs> I give in the now because that's all I got. And I receive abundantly. Together. And I receive abundantly.